Good morning. Well, I'm afraid we're going to go back into a very difficult topic. I seem to do that to people. <laughs> <clears throat> I want to start by asking you to listen to a story about another church and another time and place. I was in Ghana speaking on violence against women and children, and while there, we visited Cape Coast Castle. Hundreds of thousands of Africans were forced through its dungeons and through its door of no return onto slave ships. There were five dungeon chambers for women, and there were five for men. Descending down into the darkness of one of those dungeons felt very claustrophobic. 200 men were shackled and chained together. They stayed in that dungeon for about three months before being shipped across the Atlantic. We stood in one of the male dungeons listening in the darkness to the whole horrific story when our guide said this to us. Do you know what is above this dungeon? And our heads shook. The chapel, he said. Directly above 200 shackled men, some of them dead, some screaming, all of them sitting in filth, sat God worshipers. They sang, they read the scriptures, and they prayed, and I suppose they took up an offering for the less fortunate. The slaves could hear the service. The worshipers could sometimes hear the slaves although they had someone down there making them behave so as not to disturb church. It took my breath away. The evil, the suffering, the humiliations, the injustice were overwhelming, and the visual parable was stunning. The people in the chapel were numb to the horrific trauma and suffering beneath them. In fact, they were actively complicit. Under the form of worship in the chapel of Ghana lay the darkness of slavery, oppression, and tyranny, all things that blight and destroy humans created in the image of our God. But I think you know that Christianity does not look like being folded up with evil and worshiping on top of dungeons and following Christ does not look like complicity with a system that butters our bread and fills our coffers built on the backs of those created in the image of God. It does not look like praying and singing and giving money on top of screams and unspeakable uh, suffering. Our guide pointed up to the church and he said, heaven above, hell below. But I would argue that heaven was not above, for that is not what heaven does. <clears throat> and it is what heaven actually does that is the reason we are here. Heaven leaves the chapel and goes down into the dungeon in order to bring those who are enslaved out into light and freedom so they in turn can go back and bring out more. Heaven uses all power to bless humans. God has sown his life in you and me, and in the midst of this dark and fallen world filled with ruined humanity, he has sown his life in us, and he's flung us out. God has, however, also made it very clear that the enemy has sown seed as well, and it is growing and maturing right there with the wheat. It is with us. It is not just out there. God has said so, and he said it will be so until he returns. The Cape Coast dungeons were hidden under the chapel. They were not a separate building, and they were not outside the walls of the fort. Our God has called us not to ignore the dungeons in or under or outside our sanctuaries. We are hearing the term spiritual abuse more frequently these days. The very joining of such words into a coherent title is appalling. It is horrifying that such words should work together. It is horrifying that those words actually make sense to us. They should not. Consider the words with me, compliments of Webster, of course. 
spiritual means sacred, divine, holy. Abuse, to use wrongly, misuse, treat in a harmful or injurious way, to deceive, to commit sexual assault upon. And we are talking about such things in the context of the Christian church. Christian, pertaining to the teachings of Jesus Christ, living based on the teachings of Jesus Christ, exhibiting a spirit proper of a follower of Jesus Christ, as in having a loving regard for others. Church, a place for Christian worship, a body of believers in Jesus Christ. So what do we have when we string it all together? We have persons organized as the body of Jesus Christ, doing a work for him in this world, ostensibly for his glory, and rather than demonstrating loving regard for others, as we might expect, using or following that which is abusive to misuse, injure, and harm others. When we do this, we look like Cape Coast Castle. So spiritual abuse is about using the spiritual in order to abuse or cover it up. When we see spiritual language, spiritual position, and spiritual words, we are using things spiritual in that circumstance to do what is ungodly. We are doing abusive things stamped with God's name. Spiritual abuse can be done by an individual or an entire system. Charles Jefferson, who was a pastor in New York in the early 1900s, spoke about the hosts of hell speaking through God's people. It's a disturbing image, isn't it? Consider the church in Germany following after the Nazis, or the church slaughtering people literally in God's house, or the picture I just gave you of Cape Coast. These are big images, and perhaps a bit more obvious though those deeds were clearly not obvious to the church at the time when it was happening. Now listen, Michael was eight years old when he first went to summer camp. He was scared, he was away from his parents, he didn't know anybody, he was homesick. And his counselor paid special attention to him and it helped a lot. And then the counselor started taking him for walks in the woods after they had devotions at night in the cabin. And he started touching him in weird ways and doing other things Michael did not understand. He tried to tell the nurse that something was not right, but she told him he was saying bad things and that his counselor was a great kid and the son of the camp director. And he would never do anything to hurt one of the kids. Sarah's parents were missionaries in Asia. When she was seven, they took her on an airplane to another country and left her in a boarding school. She missed her parents and her home very much. While there, she lived in a dorm with lots of other girls and a man and his wife who took care of them. The man came into their room, the room she shared with another girl every night to pray with them. They had to kneel next to him on the floor. And while they knelt, he would touch them on their bottoms for a long time. He told them after prayer that if they told their parents, it would force the parents to come and get them to leave the school, and then their parents could not tell people about Jesus anymore. Melissa went to see her pastor about her marriage. Her husband was an alcoholic and very abusive. He would keep her up at night, sitting in a chair, screaming and cursing at her, and then he would fall asleep until the afternoon. She would pull herself together to get the kids to school and go to work because they desperately needed the outcome, the income. She haltingly told the pastor some things about her marriage. He was kind and invited her to return. He wondered if maybe her husband was abusive because their sex life was not great, and he thought he could help her with that. Her husband often said things about her failures in that area, so she thought maybe the pastor was right. It began slowly and subtly at first. It was just a hug at the end of a session, and then longer hugs, and then a kiss. And then he began touching her, undressing her, telling her he would teach her how to do things right, the way God wanted it to be. 
She couldn't think. She was confused. And he started having sex with her on a regular basis. Eventually, she tried to tell one of the church leader's wives, who told her husband. And some of the men in leadership sat her down and told her what she was doing was immoral. And the pastor had said she was very seductive. She was not to tell anyone else because it would hurt the church, it would hurt his ministry, and people would leave. Perhaps it was best if she just quietly went away. That would be the best for the church. Much spiritual abuse is systemic. People who are unfamiliar with the concept of systemic abuse may conceive of the abuse of power as only occurring on a one-to-one -one basis. Systemic abuse occurs when a system, like a family or an organization, a church or government, functions to foster the abuse of those it purports to protect. Even when acts of abuse are perpetrated solely by the organization's leader, his or her behaviors may be perpetuated by a systemic response with the goal being to preserve itself in reaction to a perceived threat to its existence. So let's consider a definition of systemic abuse. A system is a combination of parts forming a complex unitary whole, parts that work together. In the mechanical world, a vacuum cleaner is a system. All the parts work together for the purpose of cleaning your rugs. In an investment system, all the parts work together to increase money. A system can also be defined by an organized set of doctrines or principles that are used to explain the working arrangement of the whole system. Examples of systems are families, schools, religious institutions, political groups, and governments. Systems, even mechanical ones, are generally designed to serve. My vacuum cleaner is supposed to serve me. <laughs> Government, education, religion, and social systems, even corporations, are basically created to serve human beings. The word system in the Greek comes from two words, together, stand. So system means to stand together for a beneficent purpose. The second word, abuse, comes from the Latin word abutor, which means to misuse, to force, deceive, or waste. It includes feeding off of people, lying to them, coercing them, using them wrongly, wasting or reducing human beings by neglect, misuse, or harm. So together our term, systemic abuse, means that a system designed to serve humans is instead destructive, reducing and harming those who should find safety, care, and respect from it. So the parts of the system stand together with the purpose of serving the system rather than the system serving the people. A picture from the physical realm will increase our understanding. Our immune system is a network of parts that protects our bodies from pathogens and other foreign substances. It destroys malignancies, it removes debris. An autoimmune disorder is a disease that attacks the self rather than protects it. In other words, the, dis the tissues are attacked by their own protective system. Our own body cells are seen as foreign and the consequences can be disastrous. In order for systemic abuse to occur in a group theoretically unified around a good purpose, the overt or stated purpose is in fact not actually the governing one. For abusive conduct to be perpetrated by agents of a system, that con conduct must be facilitated by fundamental but almost always hidden properties of the system itself. In other words, there is a susceptibility to abuse that is built in at some underlying level of the system's architecture. Let me give you some examples. 
One example, I'm sure well known to all of you, is the Boy Scouts of America. Many men have come forward about their victimization as minors while in a scout troop. The stated purpose of that organization has been to assist young men in learning how to make ethical and moral choices. It is one of the largest youth organizations in the United States, and it has done much good. However, even an organization with lofty goals can fall prey to systemic abuse. So-called perversion files were kept by the Boy Scouts for almost 100 years. Many of those files expose collaboration between the Boy Scout leadership, the justice system, like the police, prosecutors, pastors, and Boy Scout leaders. And they worked together to cover up abuse for the sake of the organization that was teaching moral and ethical <laughs> behavior. So in this example, we have systems colluding in actions completely opposed to their stated purpose. So a system established to, a te to teach ethical and moral principles joined with a system of justice, and together they made immoral, unethical, and unjust choices. Clearly, the hidden purpose of system protection ultimately governed, not the boys. As a result, so-called morality, ethics, and justice worked together to silence the boys, to destroy their trust, and to protect the perpetrators. Again, a body destroying itself with disastrous consequences while believing they're preserving themselves as an ethical, moral system through unethical, immoral choices. If that doesn't hurt your brain, there's something wrong with it. <laughs> we are all painfully aware from the media reports of sexual abuse in recent years with, uh, about that in, in the faith communities. We've seen many systems that attest a spiritual purpose who have simultaneously worked hard to cover it up, deny abuse, and protect the offenders. Many have done so because they want to, quote, protect God's work, which actually means preserving an institution rather than human beings. Think about the organization RZIM, Willow Creek, Mars Hill, the recent news just in the last couple of weeks of the Catholic Church in France. After a three-year study, they uncovered 216,000 victims, covered up, mostly boys. There will be more. The people of God in their institutions have, in fact, protected organizations, power, position, wealth, many other things. We have guarded our material treasures rather than the treasure of image bearers. Talk about self-injury disastrous consequences. If you destroy the people, there is no future. As God's people, we are to resist exterior forces and form our life from within with him, manifesting his character no matter the situation. So what do we need to understand about systems and how spiritual abuse occurs in them? Well, first, systems are individuals in relationship to one another. All systems are about individuals who are gathered together for a shared purpose. This perspective is critical because if we are interested in changing a system, we can easily get overwhelmed and give up if we forget this basic fact. The power in the group itself often seems to make change impossible, but in fact, that's not true. The Atlantic slave trade, segregation in the US schools in the South, the Nazi regime, all very powerful systems, challenged by the voices of individuals, ultimately resulting in systemic change. That change was begun by people influencing others. We have seen examples of this in the lives of people like Martin Luther King, Solzhenitsyn, Bonhoeffer, not to mention our Lord Jesus Christ. 
One component of any system is the leader, like a Hitler, or a powerful, charismatic leader, dominating figure. That one person usually has a group of very close followers right around him or her with power in the system due to their access to the leader. They are the us connected to the leader, the insiders, the ones who know a lot of things, the wealthy donors perhaps, the board members, members of a favored gender or race. They are in positions of power and they work hard to protect, protect not only those positions and the power they accord, they work hard to protect the system that has granted that to them. They are overtly committed to the stated mission often with great passion, but it is, however, easy for them to get caught up in the trappings of power and gain resulting in mere preservation of the system because it gives them those outcomes. Leaders shape systems. The more desperate the system, like pre-Nazi Germany, which was very desperate after World War I, a faith community devastated by its previous pastor's sexual abuse. Hungry people, weary, worn-torn people are all eager for a champion to ride in on a white horse and make it all better. Understandably, people in these circumstances are vulner vulnerable to being controlled and, and manipulated. And in essence, they rightly long for a Messiah, but are blinded and follow the wrong one not realizing until the reality behind the stated purpose is exposed. Another component of systems is followers with less power, but often with unquestioning belief in the leadership. They have often bought into the idea that we in this institution are special and need this place to be protected at all costs. In faith settings, there are ones whose religious teachings are used to support power and maintain the leader. They are the members who alienate others in the pew when questions arise about leadership, or worse yet, they respond with allegations. There are, they are followers who follow the cause and in doing so, destroy themselves and relinquish their own voices. They are obedient, they're client, uh, compliant by action or silence. By their compliance, they align themselves with the power, not unlike an autoimmune disorder, which functions to seemingly protect the system, but in doing so is actually destroying it from the inside out. There's another type of participant in a system. They are not compliant by words or action, but by blindness. Surely a place called church full of people who say they love God cannot be abusive. It's not possible. Sadly, I fear we have all been party to that passivity. The turning of the head, a denial of the reality that we see, it can't really be true. A choice for comfort rather than disturbance. Families where the, house, uh, the spouse protects the abuser or the addict by not seeing are compliant by blindness. We have religious institutions across the world where children have reported abuse for years. And the law-abiding spiritual uh, citizens of that group have done nothing in response. We have discredited and ignored allegations. Why? Because it will disrupt the system if we acknowledge the truth. It doesn't happen in our families or church. It cannot be true because the accused is such a nice person and teaches the children and would never do anything like that. Or when it happens to an adult woman in a religious body, manipulated and abused by her own shepherd at a vulnerable time, we say it's not true. Have you heard him preach? It's, it's not possible that somebody could teach like that and then do that. And you mean, she's an adult. She probably seduced him. She must have seduced him and we ignore her screams. We actually do not believe that powerful leaders we enjoy could possibly be abusive. To suggest it is to be accused of spiritual harm. We do not want to see because if we see, we will have to act or carry the guilt of not having done so. 
we do not want to see because it threatens our beliefs in the virtue of our leaders and the worth of our system. People believe in the systems they are accustomed to. Their nation, their church, their family, the institution they work for, it's easy to do so unthinkingly. The stated goal is wonderful. We believe it. Institutions like church and family are God-ordained and therefore must be protected at all costs. The leadership is good. Did you hear what they taught? Do you know what they promised? And somehow we think the externals tell the whole story. And then, of course, there's harm of exposure. I mean, what will happen if this truth comes out? We'll be destroyed. It'll ruin the reputation of our important work. The truth will damage God's name. So let's return to the Boy Scouts for a minute. In order for those perversion or abuse files to exist for years, someone had to report the abuse. So someone knew or heard about it and reported it to somebody else, and it got written down and put into files. The leadership had a choice to respond to it or to bury it. And they buried it. They didn't destroy it. They buried it. Though obviously the file clerk knew what she was, he or she was filing. Eventually, the problem was discussed and protection from exposure rather than protection of the boys was the choice. These decisions involved many people and lasted for many decades, hidden away until victims began to stand up and speak in public for themselves. The thinking goes like this. It cannot be exposed. Our purpose is to teach boys ethical and moral principles. And if this is known, it will destroy our very fine mission. So the decision is made to hide what is unethical and immoral so as not to hurt the organization teaching ethics and morals. So we hide sexual abuse and fail to save the children. However, that decision is grossly immoral. We defend and deny truth. We cover. We react with disbelief, minimizing, lying, pretense, or trying to use words to make it look like something else. The reflexive impulse to defend often in, uh, in also uses outright lying, first to ourselves and then to others. The goal is to show what it certainly is not. So rather than calling it sexual abuse, we call it, uh, there was a little misunderstanding. We would rather believe a reassuring lie than an utterly inconvenient, disturbing truth. In Nazi Germany, the Fuhrer was bringing Germans dignity and prosperity. In Rwanda, they were bringing justice and fairness and cleansing the country of the cockroaches. In the Boy Scouts, it didn't happen, even though the files grew fatter, and we were protecting our moral mission. In religious bodies, the victim is silenced, their character assassinated, and the accused protected for the sake of God's work, or so we say. We often protect the system by protecting the accused. We say we do not want to falsely accuse, and truly, we do not. But we are not so adamant about the failure to protect. Vulnerable humans need protection in every single human system. Power easily goes awry and is misused, and there is no system so good that this is not possible. Vulnerable ones need a voice. They are, however, the most easily discounted by virtue of their very vulnerability. We tend to give more credibility to those who are not afraid who exude confidence, who are articulate and seem important to sustaining the system. We give more credibility to power. We say the leader is strong, articulate, theologically knowledgeable and gifted. How can you speak ill of a leader who is doing God's work? How can you speak ill of someone who teaches like that? And so we stand behind him or her and say we know him, and he would never fail to protect the vulnerable, so therefore it can't be true. So stop maligning his character and threatening his good work. We protect the reputation of the system. 
We protect a particular race or ethnicity as superior. We protect a nation as exceptional. We say we are the God-ordained people. We are a faith-based organization. We stand for morality and purity. We say we are the ones who serve children or youth or the lost, as if that meant no one in our organization would ever perpetrate against them. And unlike our Lord, we nod and say how important that person or group is and is being misunderstood. We give no weight to the weak, the desperate voice of those being crushed. Now God thought up spiritual systems. He created family, the people of Israel, the church. He intends for those to be vibrant and full of a likeness to him. They are to bless his world. They are to be a force for righteousness in his world, which is simply Christ-likeness among people. And when they are not, his people who are called by his name are to humble themselves and seek his face and give the call to repentance and righteousness so that he might be truly glorified in his work, even in its hidden, folded up corners. And finally, the truth cannot get out because it will hurt our reputation. In the Christian world, we deny what we hear because we want to protect the name of God. If word gets out that we have someone fraudulent or abusing children or battering a spouse or treating group members in nasty, bullying ways, then the reputation of God will be marred. We must present it, prevent it. So how can it be wrong to protect the name of God, right? And such a good work. But again, we are using good words to cover ungodly deeds. Remember we said at the beginning that system means together stand. It creates a formidable force, as I'm sure you know. But there is another important work embodied in people like Solzhenitsyn or Bonhoeffer and in Jesus himself, and that word is dissident. And it literally means to sit apart. Our Lord stood apart from systems, from Rome, from the synagogue in Jerusalem, which had been designed by God. So you who are struggling in your lives and situations with broken, tyrannical, abusive systems that others call good, remember this. It is vital that we see truly and clearly and call things by their right name. That's called living in truth. And to fail to do that will be spiritual abuse by silence. Wrong labels cover things up. Wrong labels confuse sheep and turn off the light. The change of massive systems comes only one by one. It looks impossible, it looks hopeless. But one by one, light breaks through. I have worked with hundreds of victims of sexual abuse. Many have been from families where abuse was passed down from one generation to the another and to another. But then someone steps out and speaks the truth. Oh, the system closes against them, wants them to go away. But they pursue the truth. And they do the courageous work of facing the lies and choosing a new way, little by little. And you know what? Their children have a different path. They may grow up with a parent that is tortured by their own uh, memories and struggling with it and all of those things, but they never have an abusive hand laid on their bodies for the first time, sometimes in six generations. They have a parent who's trying hard to find freedom from the old lies, but they have no sexual abuse. It's a new way to be a child in that family. And the grandchildren who come later, they do not really know what sexual abuse is. They hear about it in school. They don't know about it from home. They have to be told about it so they can be protected from those who might hurt them. But they never once go to sleep at night wondering if they'll be safe tonight in their bed. Do not be anesthetized by so-called good systems. 
or controlled by bad ones and complicit by a chosen blindness because it makes your life more comfortable. No matter the spiritual language they use, do not sit down hopeless thinking it's too big to change and nothing can happen. One by one, change occurs and sh shapes generations. One by one, change occurs and can change organizations. I want to read you a poem. It was written by a, a woman who's seen me. Um, she grew up in churches, well-known churches. She's the child of an abusive family that's abusive for generations and the victim of many during her childhood, not just one. She's endured much. But she is beginning to learn who her father in heaven actually is and that his heart is broken with what was done to her, that it has nothing to do with him. And doesn't look anything like he looks. So in July, when the, I think it were, they were called the Champlain Towers fell down and people died, um, she wrote this poem because it made her think about many of the churches that she had been in over the years that covered up abuse in other ways. And she entitled it Stepping on Her Gown. It was a day like any other with children from 923 gathering their buckets and shovels, a weary mother taking little hands and heading back home. The retired couple from 703 sitting on their balcony, sipping coffee and reading papers, chronicling the joys and the tragedies of the day. 519 welcoming its frail, wi recently widowed silver head resident to a now lonely space and what his wife had always called their nest. A family of four in 217, suitcases packed by the door, traveling up north for a visit and grandparents following a needed night's rest. Good night, Mommy. I love you, could be heard from 913. Don't forget to take your pills from 702. In 519, he looked at the photo of his bride of 60 years sitting on the table beside his bed and shut his eyes. While down in 217, one last FaceTime with grandma and grandpa before drifting off to sleep. And then the building began to creak. The foundation crying out, having warned its inhabitants for years, though most didn't really understand. The truth mostly held in glossed over some hidden, mostly forgotten reports left with those in higher positions and with authority. Documented sightings and warning of leaks of cracks and breaks within and without. Severe deterioration found in the columns, the beam, beams and the walls, endangering lives, health and the safety of all. Repairs overlooked or ignored. Too extensive and costly to bother. Additionally, major disturbance and inconvenience to those who worked and resided. But safety and comfort and health come at great cost. Just ask the loved ones of those who were lost. In what would be seconds, the units collapsed. And on their way down, the humans calling it home, believing it's safe, having trusted those with titles and power, would take their last breath and meet death. While just across town, across the state, the nation, and the seas, the organs play. Human hymns are sung and preachers preach. The greeters at the door and every aisle smile. Plates are passed, but there are drips, breaks, and cracks, and questions are asked. Answers are slow, if given at all. Investigations hidden incomplete or refused. Change and transparency are said to be soon. Nothing an NDA or committee can't cover. The message is clear. Stop disturbing the work of the church if you love her. 
side by side, Christ and his bride. Do you hear him? He, the God of light, is calling for radical, uncomfortable change. To look beyond what's pretty and see we are stepping on her gown. The church is coming down. His sheep are being crushed. Every time we silence a victim, ignore, refuse to talk about, don't face the truth, we're helping it come down. And we're doing it to the body of Christ the way they did it to the tower. And part of our call today is to know that the places in which you serve are God's houses, not yours. And his house is to look like him. It is to be safe and full of truth and care and love no matter the cost, because that is the pattern that he left us, no matter the cost. <laughs>